that nature is a sacred text. The mountains and the lakes and the grassy lands are as readable as scripture. I am reminded of this lesson every time that I surrender myself to the wilderness. When I allow myself more than the hasty five minute walk around the block and actually take in what is around me. I spent a lot of time doing just that during my vacation in Vermont. As I walked along root knotted trails, my breaths deepened, my mind slowed and I began to hear the preaching of creation. I became enamored by mushrooms. <laughs> Have you ever really looked at mushrooms? It's been a very wet summer in Vermont and mushrooms are everywhere. And I began to marvel at them, little diversity of shapes and colors Orange mushroom, mushrooms springing out of tree stumps like confetti, giant blooms that just covered the forest floor. There's these really cool mushroom, mushrooms called ink cap mushrooms that as they deteriorate, start to stain everything around them. All of these tiny immaculate things that I would ordinarily brush past made me go, Thank God that I worship a creator who has put such diversity and beauty into the smallest of things. And one hike, it passed through this sea of moss and fern, and it was the greenest place I have ever been. So green that it almost hurt my eyes. And yet, as I stood there, I began to notice this variety of shades. I tried to take pictures of it, but of course, my camera couldn't capture what I was experiencing in that moment. And the mossy glade created this cushion that just quieted everything. And in that stillness, I was reminded of the scripture where God comes not in the fire or in the windstorm, but in that sheer stillness. And then there was this sunset that stopped me and my family in our tracks. And we just stood and watched and watched as the sun slowly made its way out from behind one mountain peak and then began to dip below another. And as each minute passed, the light and the shadow began to reveal different images of the valleys and the mountains that were beginning to turn their famous New England fall colors. And I just turned to my dad and in a very not profound way said, God is so cool. <laughs> it was not my most prophetic sermon by far, but it was all that I could say to even try to capture what I was feeling. But my favorite moment, not of the entire vacation, my favorite moment was marrying Noah again, but my maybe second favorite moment was every morning something I made a bit of a ritual. We were staying right by a lake. And every morning, despite the chill, I would go and I would plunge myself into the lake as part of my morning prayer. And my prayers that week, they had no words. Instead, my prayer was encapsulated by the call of a bird or by the sound of water lapping on stone. 
feeling for a few moments that I was part of this vast network of creation. I didn't have to go all the way to Vermont for that, of course. <laughs> I returned from vacation with this renewed intention to spend more time with the natural world. So just this week when I was upstairs working, I was really paying attention to a spider that had taken up residence, thankfully, outside the window. And on Tuesday, she had built quite an impressive web. And she was sitting there, regal, like a queen in the middle of her network. But then, on Thursday, the rain had washed it all away, much like the famous children's song. And I really wondered where she had gone. Had the waters carried her very far away? Or was she hiding somewhere in the eaves waiting to rebuild? The psalmist writes, there is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Yes, I think me and the psalmist agree that nature is a sacred text as readable as scripture. And dwelling with this text has made me well. What do I mean by that? What does it mean to be well or to live well? People have a lot of thoughts about wellness. In recent years, wellness has become an entire industry. There are more wellness brands and wellness companies than one could count. And the definition of wellness depends very much on who you ask. When I was studying social work, several texts referenced this wheel of wellness that was divided up into eight sectors, social, emotional, spiritual, intellectual, physical, environmental, financial, and occupational. Whew. If you take a scroll through Instagram, on the other hand, you'll find wellness defined as beauty brands, meal kits, and really cute little vitamin packages. Wellness, it's very much for sale these days, which I will admit has reeled me in on more than one occasion. I bought one of those cute little vitamin packages. They did not make my skin better, as promised. They just made my stomach hurt. At other points though, the wellness industry has made me a bit of a skeptic. When I was studying theology, I read this book called Purity and Danger by a philosopher named Mary Douglas. And she points out that humans are really good at creating systems of division around purity, things like healthy or unhealthy, beautiful and ugly, clean and dirty. She writes that ideas about separating have as their main function to impose system on an inherently untidy experience. Impose system on an inherently untidy experience. She's basically saying that we like to create some of these categories because human life is so often a mess. And if serving as a pastor and a therapist has taught me anything, it's that life is messy. And that experiences of illness and pain, loss, mental health struggle will touch all of us in one way or another. So when anyone promises balance, perfect health and eternal wellness, 
I shake my head, or I end up with a bottle of useless vitamins. I say all of this with the knowledge that we, as a church, are going to spend the next month or so exploring wellness, what it means to be well in light of our faith. Now, I clearly don't find it very useful to think of wellness as an industry, nor do I find it useful to think of wellness as this binary standard. Either you're doing a great job and you are well, or you're not doing a good job. Instead, I like to define wellness as a journey to be in touch with our humanity, to give attention and nourishment to our bodies, our minds, our souls, and our relationships. And so perhaps ironically, I think that part of being well is being honest about when things are not well at all. And on a macro level, Things are not well. This past year has brought plague, war, famine, fire, drought, massive gun violence, deep economic insecurity, and a near constitutional crisis. On a macro level, things are not well. And on a personal level, each of us listening right now knows the answer to how things are going how things are going for us, how things are going for the people that we love. But my sense as a pastor and as a therapist and as just a regular old human who has lived through the past year and a half is that there's a lot of pain and anger and grief and uncertainty Being well means naming that, acknowledging it, and exploring what we might do with it. And one thing we might do with it is to dwell with sacred texts, written and unwritten. Texts that bring us in touch with our humanity and our creatureliness. I don't know if you're familiar with this word, creatureliness. It is a word. And it's one I really like because it, it acknowledges the fact that us as humans have needs, just like any other creature. We need to be fed and we need to be watered. We need to be cared for. We need shelter and companionship. We need rest. And this word creatureliness, it also acknowledges that we are just one part of this network of creation, something that I was reminded when I was plunging into that lake. We are part of this network that is held by God, a God whose very first word was to create. And I think that the psalmist is in touch with their creatureliness. Listen again to these words, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims her handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Everything around us from the night sky to the morning sun is a reminder of God's faithful presence. I have to believe that this psalmist spent some time in nature. What else could have inspired a psalm like this? And I want to encourage you to read this one again this week. Maybe every morning, read this text. It is so rich. And the psalmist moves from this encounter with creation to say, nature reminds me of God's qualities and God is wise. God is joyful. God is enduring. God is just. God is sweet. God revives the soul. And who doesn't need a little revival of the soul these days? I was sitting out on my balcony to work on this sermon on Friday, and it started to rain. I don't know if anyone else found themselves in the middle of that rainstorm. And it was the most beautiful moment. 
because I just sat there thinking, amen, God. Revive my soul. Just as this rain revives the dirt of the earth, you revive my soul. I wish that I could somehow make it rain in the sanctuary right now. I know that would create many problems for us later, but if I could do it for just a moment, I think that that would say more about this psalm than my words ever could. God, you revive our souls. Dwelling with the sacred text of nature, it brings us to praise, but it also brings us to acknowledge things that aren't well. The psalmist does that in our text. They acknowledge hurt and ask for forgiveness and guidance. Using those all familiar words, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable. Guide me, God. Let my words be acceptable in your sight. The psalmist they read the sacred text of the wilderness, moving from creation encounter to a praise moment to a request for help. And this movement, I believe, is an example of a wellness practice, a way of being in touch with the core of our humanity. And the psalmist is not the only poet we've heard from this morning. Jane also gave us the words of Mary Oliver, a poet who constantly brings me in touch with my humanity and my creatureliness. She describes an afternoon strolling through the fields, an activity that is idle and unproductive and deeply healing. And she reads the sacred text of a grasshopper, helping us notice the magnificence that is all around us. And she asks, again, that beautiful question, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? We only get one. And it is indeed wild and messy and so very precious. As one of my favorite theologians, Kate Bowler, says, this human life requires great courage and it requires great hope. Our lives are so precious, my friends. They are precious to me. They are precious to God. And I want all of us coming out of this past year and a half to be well, not as measured by any metric but as felt in our souls. I want us to be well by being the magnificent creatures that we are. I want us to be well by seeking help when we need it. I want us to be well by listening to the sound of rain and feeling the rays of the sun. For God's voice does ring to all corners of her creation, proclaiming Love and love abundant for each and every living being. Amen. Amen.